Hey, Hammy here, back with part three of 8.3, uh, which we'll finish up the chapter on biotechnology. Uh, in this video, we wanna look at some examples in agriculture and how biotechnology is helping us farmers out. Okay, one of the first terms you'll need to know when we talk about biotech in agriculture is this idea of a transgenic organism. Okay, trans means across, genome so across genomes so you're gonna they are organisms that have been genetically modified we have taken genes from one organism and put them into another organism okay so transgenic across genomes uh, some examples of some transgenic crops okay or plants that farmers are using a, around the world uh, is this idea of herbicide resistance. Remember herbicide uh, is something that kills plants. So they actually found in one of the waste ponds uh, where they were producing glyphosate. Okay, glyphosate is the main ingredient in a herbicide we call Roundup. Your parents might have some that they spray the cracks in their driveway and sidewalks to kill the dandelions and stuff. Well, in these ponds, there was a bacterium uh, that was had a resistance gene to this Roundup, to this glyphosate. And so they took that gene and put it into all kinds of things like corn. Okay, This now makes it easier or more efficient for the farmer to grow their corn. They can plant their field of corn, Roundup ready corn. And when it starts growing and all the weeds and stuff start growing as well, uh, they can go down through the field and spray Roundup. Roundup is fairly inexpensive and not super dangerous. And <clears throat> I mean, I wouldn't want to drink this stuff, but compared to some of the other things uh, that they used in the 70s and 80s uh, in order to spray for weeds, uh, there was like 2,4-D and some other things that were part, you know, derivatives of like Agent Orange and stuff like that in uh, they used to kill vegetation in the Vietnam War. Uh, glyphosate and Roundup is, is fairly inexpensive and I can go down the row and I can spray my corn or my soybeans and it kills all the weeds, all the competition for the corn that will be using water and nutrients out of the soil, but it doesn't kill the corn. So it makes it much more efficient uh, for the farmers to grow their crop. Uh, there's more, there's another trait called the BT trait. Uh, the BT trait uh, came from a bacterium a soil bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis. Let's make sure I spell this right. Thuringiensis. Okay, that's where we get the BT from. And this soil bacteria made uh, a, a protein, a toxin that's a protein that when it gets into insect guts, it causes them to kind of get leaky and they sort of their guts just kind of ooze out. And so we've put this BT trait into crops like corn, okay, so that when the worms start eating at the top one, this is BT corn, okay, and then this is what uh, this would be non GMO corn down here. So you can see here the worms have gotten into the end of this ear on the stalk, allowed moisture in there. Some of the ears kernels are sprouting. Doesn't look very nice. Here the, the earworms take a couple munch, 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 and then they get sick and they die and they fall off. And so it helps prevent this. Uh, other things like corn borer is a big pest for farmers that will bore into the stalk of the plant. Okay, when it's boring into the stalk of the plant, if it gets windy, then you get stalk lodging where the, the stalks are weak and they get a windstorm or thunderstorm and they blow over. And that really affects the yields. So BT trait has been a big one uh, for farmers to help them uh, be more economical. Some other things we've done is increase the nutrition of some plants. Uh, golden rice, uh, which you see over here, has this nice yellow color versus regular rice. Okay, uh, what they did is they took the derivative or the beginnings of the beta carotene, okay, which is actually they took out of a daffodil. So if you really know daffodils in the springtime have kind of this yellowish color too. Okay, beta carotene is important for eye health. 
Well, who eats a lot of rice? Well, a lot of uh, poor countries around the world, rice is easy to grow and easy to access. So they're trying to convince them to grow this golden rice. But there's also a lot of vision problems. Well, beta carotene in conjunction with vitamin A uh, helps vision or eye health. And so we can reduce a lot of the vision problems uh, if we can convince some people around the world to grow golden rice, which has a higher nutritional value than just regular rice. Now, the problem is it looks different than regular rice. Uh, so it's convincing the people that it's okay, it's safe to eat, and it's better for you. Uh, and so we kind of have to get over some of those uh, things, you know, that we food is very important to us and if it looks different or doesn't taste the same then people aren't going to eat it okay so just some examples of things that we've done to crops when we look at crops across the u.s uh, you can see a lot of things corn soybeans cotton are a big one um, potatoes papayas um, papayas there's apples potatoes. There's been a lot of different transgenic crops um, developed. Uh, kind of the big three in the U.S., soybeans, co corn, and cotton. Uh, and these are kind of the most recent rates that I could find. In, two, in the year 2000, about 54% of soybeans, 25% of corn, and 61% of cotton uh, were genetically modified that were grown in the U.S., by 2005, soybeans that had jumped to 87% for beans doubled to about 52% in corn, so about all half of the corn in the U.S., and about 79% of the cotton. Uh, and the most recent number I could find was 2013, 2013 and about 93% of all soybeans, about 90% of all corn, and about 90% of all cotton are genetically modified. Why? There must be something there. The seeds are more expensive uh, for this technology. Why are farmers buying it? Because it saves them money and it's increasing yields and it's more efficient for them to grow in the long run. And there's other things out there as well, like uh, uh, genetically modified alfalfa and rice and those kind of things as well. And there's new products constantly being developed by the biotech companies uh, to help the farmers out. Now, how are bio or genetically modified plants made? Okay, it's done with a bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. Uh, it used to be done with a little gene gun that would, they take little gold BBs, tiny gold BBs and coat them with the DNA and blasted at the plant, hopefully that the BBs would go into the plant tissue, into the nucleus, and the plant would uptake uh, the DNA. Uh, now, the more, uh, more uh, better way, I guess, would be a more efficient way, I'm trying to say, is to use this bacterium. Okay, they take a desired gene like Roundup resistance, okay, and remember, just like we did in lab with restriction enzymes, okay, they put it into a plasmid, put the plasmid back into the agrobacterium. This agrobacterium affects plant cells or infects plant cells, and it works by taking over the plant cell and it inserts this its DNA into the nucleus of the plant cell. So it's gonna carry this new gene like glyphosate or Roundup resistance into the plant cells for the scientist. Uh, and then they get those plant cells to start growing into clumps or little plant cell cultures. And then they need to stimulate those to grow into the actual plant. And this takes years and years of research uh, because, you know, to get this to work and to get it into the right varieties of corn and soybean and so forth that we need to use. Uh, but it's kind of interesting how this is done. They actually put the gene uh, that the scientist wants to put in the plant it's taken into the plant by this little agrobacterium. So you may see that name, may see that name again because it's used quite a bit to make transgenic plants. Uh, when we look at transgenic animals, there's a whole host of things that are being done. Uh, it's being done uh, in cows and goats to increase milk production or even produce uh, fish with more omega-3 fatty acids in. Um, 
eggs and chickens, those kind of things to increase the uh, production, also to increase the nutritional value. Uh, there's a transgenic salmon, okay, which I have a picture of down here, uh, that grow much quicker than the wild ones, so they can be farm raised. Okay, you can see here that normally it takes about uh, 36 months for an Atlantic salmon, okay, to reach uh, the right kind of its adult size, where this Aqua Bounty Aqua Advantage salmon can reach adult size in 16 to 28 months. Okay, so in almost half the time, and they'll grow much bigger as well, which bigger, more meat, right? And salmon is a uh, one of the um, bigger fish consumed by uh, people in the U.S. Uh, goats have been used in transgenic experiments, and uh, they've produced milk with anything from spider silk in it, uh, which we could use as protective cases or bulletproof vests because you know how spider silk is really, really strong. Uh, antibiotics and so forth that would be in the goat milks, uh, insulin, that type of thing. Uh, maybe there's even a possibility of bringing back endangered species. Uh, right now we're finding, you know, frozen woolly mammoths the last couple decades up in Siberia and so forth. Can we take DNA from the woolly mammoth <clears throat> and splice it with a modern Asian elephant and reprogram those cells to grow into a woolly mammoth. Could we bring things back from extinction? Uh, as the recording of this video, there's only like two white rhinos, northern white rhinos left in Africa, and the last male has died. And so it's just a matter of time before those next two white rhinos die and they'll be extinct. Okay, there's nothing we can do. But if we preserve their DNA, uh, is there a way that we could possibly clone them to try to bring back the white rhino or keep it from going extinct? Uh, so some kind of some cool things that are being done. Another big topic you hear about when it comes to biotechnology is this idea of cloning. Okay, and one of the first cloning of a mammal that was done was Dolly the sheep, okay, over in Ireland. And what they did is they took a donor egg from a black-faced sheep, okay, and they removed the nucleus out of it. Okay, they took the nucleus out, so it's just an empty egg cell. They took a nucleus from a white-faced sheep, so there's a very different phenotypic, or a phenotypic difference between the two, so it'll be real obvious. And they got the nucleus, the two cells, to fuse together, with a little bit of electrical shock, okay? And then they got that egg fused, that new nucleus into the egg cell and it started growing. They put it into a surrogate mother with a black face and notice what came out. Dolly was a white face sheep. Okay? And so they've been able to clone all different kinds of, of animals. Uh, the first uh, cat they did, they called the copy cat okay copycat uh, kind of clever right and we've cloned all kinds of mammals since then uh, can we clone humans well it's kind of illegal to do that there are two ideas I want you to know when it comes to cloning humans there's reproductive cloning and therapeutic cloning okay in therapeutic cloning well, I guess first reproductive cloning is where you're going to take uh, like some skin cells. Let's say we want to clone hammy. So I take some cheek cells and somatic. Remember, that means body cells. I'm going to take the nucleus out, try to put it in an empty egg cell from another human. So take their nucleus out, put my nucleus in, and then try to get that to start growing into an embryo. And then I'd have to be planted into a host or surrogate mother. And then I would have a baby that would be a clone of me. And I understand this doesn't mean we could take like Hitler and all of a sudden boom, 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 like in the old sci-fi movies where out of this machine come all these adult Hitlers. Okay, it would be just like your identical twin, only it's going to be born as of now 41 years ago. So will it be just like me? Genetically, yes, but remember you're a product of your environment too. So how much of the culture, uh, the time that I grew up, 
uh, and my parents raising me, how did that make me who I am today? And how did that influence my genes? Uh, would that cloned baby be exactly, exactly like me? Very similar, uh, but would be different. It'd be like identical twins uh, that might be hard to tell apart, okay? But would maybe act and have different senses of humor and that kind of thing, okay? So that's reproductive cloning. That's pretty controversial. And in uh, most places in the world, that is illegal to do. The other type is therapeutic cloning, on uh, which we'll take those embryonic stem cells and then use those embryonic stem cells to try to cure something. Uh, maybe grow me a new liver or a kidney or try to, um, if I get leukemia, try to replace my bone marrow with healthy bone marrow. Uh, nowadays, when babies are born, you can get some companies uh, to take the umbilical cord blood that has a lot of stem cells, and you can actually have it cryogenically frozen for the right price. Uh, in case your kid ever has some type of blood cancer or something else, they might be able to use those uh, stem cells from when they were born to try to cure that disease. So therapeutic, they're trying to cure some kind of disease or cancer or a genetic condition. Whereas reproductive, they're going to try to like clone you, make a copy of you. Okay. So those are different uses that we use for cloning. Then finally, some uh, ethical, legal, and social issues. So now your mind is racing about oh my goodness, we can do all these things. Okay, the use of bio, biotechnology has raised some issues. Uh, designer babies, which we'll talk about in class. How far should we go to prevent uh, mutations or disorders in our kids to actually designing physical phenotypic type characteristics or physiological muscle mass, eye color, skin color, those kind of things. Should we clone humans or should we clone animals? Okay, we've been cloning plants for years. When you take a cutting and plant it, you've cloned it. Uh, we've been cloning animals for decades now. What about humans? It, would there ever be a uh, time when that would be okay? Uh, who controls your DNA information? Uh, the Congress passed Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act in 2008, where they said insurance companies and other stuff cannot use your DNA against you. Uh, they can't look at my DNA and say, oh, I see in your DNA, you're probably going to have heart disease and a good chance of having cancer. So we're going to up your insurance rates. They're not allowed to do that. Okay, in 2008, they passed laws. Uh, can genes be patented? Can I find human genes and patent them so that no one else can work with them? Well, luckily, the Supreme Court uh, in 2013 uh, said that you cannot, you cannot patent human genes. Okay, uh, which leaves that research open for other scientists to try to come up with cures. And a big one that you'll read a lot about on the internet are GMO foods or foods with uh, genetically modified ingredients, which some estimates are about three-fourths or 75% of the food you see in the supermarket has genetically modified ingredients in it made from GMO corn syrup or something like that. Are they safe to eat? Well, as of 1992, the FDA... I uh, took a look at it and did a bunch of studies, and they're generally recognized as safe. Uh, and you can remember back to the slide since early 2000s, so the last 10, 15, 20 years, uh, we've been consuming genetically modified organisms and have not seen long term effects of that. Uh, so, uh, but you know, maybe down the road, you know, the possibility of creating allergens or something like that uh, that might really affect people. Uh, we need to make sure that it's safe. Uh, what about the environment? Is growing all of this genetically modified stuff affecting anything in the environment? We see uh, stuff like uh, Palmer amaranth, which is a weed for farmers. Uh, ragweed and some things are becoming Roundup resistant. And uh, it's making harder for farmers to use Roundup as a herbicide. And so, so there's a lot of education that needs to be done with people on how to properly use the stuff to prevent that from happening. So just some sort of 
social, ethical, legal issues that when biotechnology comes up, how far are we advancing humankind and making life easier? And are we possibly creating other problems? We've got to balance those two things when we think about these new technologies.